where do you want to begin? I think I must first tell about my, uh, when I was young, a long <laughs> time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. I was five years old. Then I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And he came. He didn't say you are too young, but he came. And he never has left me. And I can tell you a little bit about what it means to go with Jesus through life. I had a very happy uh, youth. It was a very full house. Uh, I had, um, we had three aunts, uh, three sisters of mother who were living with us and uh, education was not always so easy for they all tried to educate us. And your home was where in Holland? In Haarlem. And we lived in a watchmaker's shop. And by the way, Corey, you were the first woman licensed yes. watchmaker. Yes, yes. Uh, I helped my father and <laughs> it was uh, good that I got my license and I enjoyed the work and uh, we were a real team, father and I. We were uh, sitting there in the uh, in the workshop and we had uh, both a Bible in our drawer and we had fine talks. I learned so very much from Father. You know, Father saw the everyday life so beautiful. He said sometimes to me, Corrie, my name is on the shop. But really, God's name should be on the shop, for I am a watchmaker by the grace of God. And that is what I really have experienced, how someone sees that everything belongs to the Lord. And we had a real, a very happy life, but um, you know already through the book that uh, we have um, saved Jewish people in that terrible time that the Nazis uh, intended to kill all the Jewish people. Now, uh, it is interesting when I can tell you something that happened in 1844. My grandfather, also a watchmaker, said to his friends, say, uh, come to my house and let us pray for the Jews and for the peace of Jerusalem. And every week they came together to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the blessing of the Jews. Hundred years later, exactly in that same house, grandfather's father, Four of his grandchildren and a great-grandson were arrested because we had saved Jewish people. That was a divine but not mm -hmm. to understand answer mm -hmm. on prayer for the Jews. That was part of God's plan. Yes. God has plans, no problems. There's never a panic <laughs> in heaven. But we, we had indeed... Uh, done as much as we could to save the Jewish people and uh, it was it was a dangerous work and often people said to father if you have always Jews in your house you once will end up in prison father was old but father said if I come in prison, I will not uh, stay alive. I'm too old for prison life. But it will be an honor to me to give my life for God's ancient people, the Jews. And that is what really happened. Tell me about the house. It was so built that you were able to hide so many in your home. And your home was very old, right? Yes. We had a hiding place, and but there could be only eight people. But and it was uh, that was a secret room. And when we were arrested, the people who were in the secret room have not been found. So it was a very blessed secret room. But our life, our work was to bring the Jews to other uh, first to other countries to help them to go to. England or to Switzerland, but later that was impossible, and then we placed them in many different homes, 
but we took care for food, for ration cards, and for all the many things that uh, had to be done. And uh, it was a very busy life, but uh, at last we were betrayed. And <coughs> that was that was a terrible time, but perhaps I must also tell you that the time that we had these Jews in house was dangerous, but we have never laughed so much as in that time. Jews have such a good sense of humor. And we had uh, really, well, uh, we made it as uh, happy as we could. And you had to joy the Lord. Yes. That, 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 that was it. We, we knew that whatever happens, those who love God, all things work for the best. And so there was not a real uh, angst, uh, the real fear. We were not afraid. But we, uh, it was for the Jews difficult to be in a house and never to come out, not, not, never to have an opportunity to make a walk. Only when it was very dark in the evening. But we had a good time, and I, uh, I um, uh, think of Eusi. Eusi was one of uh, my, the finest Jews who always stayed in our house. The others, many went to other uh, houses, but Eusi stayed. And he gave Hebrew lessons. And Father, although he was 84 years old, he said he also uh, wanted to learn Hebrew. And he did. And we had a really an, a good time together, but always the terrible background of danger. But uh, in some way, <laughs> I think of, of Piet Hartog. Uh, I worked with many young people, and I remember that once we heard that in a Jewish orphanage, all the babies had to be killed. And I called my boys, I had 30 boys who worked with me, and 20 girls, 20... Uh, and the and Jewish orphanage was where? That was in Amsterdam. And I said to my boys, boys, there's work for you to do. You must save these Jewish uh, babies. How many? Now, I believe there were 100. And these boys stole about 100 babies. And stole them? Yeah, we st they stole them. How no. did they do it? Uh, in the I, night? No, they... Oh, I must tell you a secret. Sometimes there came uh, good German soldiers to me and said, we will not stay uh, work any longer for that Adolf Hitler, always to kill Jewish people. Can you help us? And I said, always, oh, sure, I can help you. And I sent them... And they were in the German army? Yes. And we sent them to a farm far away, and they stayed for the duration of the war, and we took their uniforms. Can you understand what that meant? When our boys stole the babies, they had German uniforms. So they could just go over the street, and they ca came into that, that house, and the father of the orphanage was in the secret. And uh, then we, uh, uh, they took the babies to a house far away from the town, and my girls distributed all these babies in one day. That was not difficult. <laughs> For just imagine that I have a baby in my hand. I say, now, listen, will you save this baby? And if you don't do it, and I cannot find another uh, address, this baby will be killed. Of course you should take it. And so in one day we had all the babies uh, in, uh, in the families. And I rem uh, remember Piet Hartog. He was such a fine, brave boy. Piet said, said I believe we do the most important work that exists. Just, <laughs> uh, just saving lives. I don't long to go back to, uh, to college. This is life. W was he Jewish? No, he was one of my, the boys who helped to Dutch. save the Jews. Dutch, yes, they were all Dutch. And he said, I, I, I like this, this work. It was, it was good to save these b babies. I said, Pete, there's one work that is more important than saving lives, and that is saving souls and tell people about the Lord Jesus. Then Pete smiled and he said, I'm a Christian, I go to church, I read my Bible and I pray, but telling about Jesus, that is good business for my pastor. I said, Pete, every Christian is called to be the light of the world. Jesus has said, like the Father has sent me, so mm -hmm. I send you. So Pete, in your life will come a time that you will see the most important work for you, to tell people the gospel. 
A half a year later, Pete came into prison and they told him he had only one week to live. And the day before he was shot, he wrote a short long letter. And he wrote, all the men and the boys in this cell are sentenced to death. And I am so glad that I could tell them that when they would receive the Lord Jesus as their Savior and would confess their sins to him, that Jesus would save them from their sins and make them children of God, and that when they died, when they were killed, they went to the house of the Father with the many mentions. Now I see, Peter wrote, now I see that the most important work for every Christian is to win souls for eternity, to win souls for Jesus Christ. Glory, the love of Jesus. You can't surpass it, you know? No, no. that isn't. And you know, this love is available for us. That's right. That is in uh, Romans 5, 5 is written, the love of God is shed abroad into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. And there you were, a Dutch lady. Your father, your grandfather, having lived in Holland all their life, your sister, and yet your own lives, you put your own lives in jeopardy because of the love that God gave you for the Jews. Yes. That was supernatural love, wasn't it, Corey? Yes, but don't forget that my greatest friend, my savior, was a Jew. His divine side was the son of mm -hmm. God, but his, uh, his uh, human side was that he was a Jew. So that is one of the reasons that I love the Jews. And, you know, I did, um, uh, I did also work among the feeble-minded. You know, feeble-minded people cannot go to the church, they cannot understand the sermon. And they, they can love the Lord, and the Lord loves them. And I have experienced that a feeble-minded can never hear too much about that love of God. I will never forget Toontje. Toontje was a feeble-minded boy, and he came every Sunday in the church, but he didn't understand the sermons. But once the minister told about that love you told about, that love of God in Jesus Christ, and suddenly the minister saw, Toontje understands me. And he forgot the rest of his audience and only spoke to Toontje. <laughs> and Toontje's face was full of joy when he heard about the ocean of God's love that we know through Jesus Christ. The next day, the pastor said, I will visit Toontje. I will know if he still remembers God's love. But when he came in the house, the mother told him, Toontje had died in his sleep and he said <coughs> I had saw on the dead face of the boy <coughs> heavenly joy uh -huh. I think that Tonja's heart has broken of joy beca because he would contain too much <laughs> of that ocean of love of God and uh, I believe that when you and I should try to have the whole ocean of love of God in our heart. Mm -hmm. Our hearts could burst of joy, <laughs> but the Holy Spirit gives us strong and fast hearts so that we see more and more of that love. I <coughs> believe that, and that is what the whole world needs today. Yes. The greatest power in the world is love. Yes. And 11 months you spent in prison Yes, at last we were betrayed, and we were arrested. Who betrayed you? That was a man who had, who had come to me and told me, my wife is in danger. She is uh, arrested. She's in the police station, and I'm sure they will kill her. And now I have found a policeman who will run the risk to set her free when we pay him 600 guilders, that's about $200. But I have no money. I said, oh man, money, what does that matter? Wait a moment, I have 200 guilders. And I asked my friends to give money and I gave him 600 guilders. And that man was a quisling. You know, a quisling that was a man who in uh, secret helped the Gestapo, but did as if he helped us. 
and uh, his wife was not at all in the prison and prison but the, the Gestapo yeah. yeah the Gestapo had so told him um, try to find out if Corrie Tambom saves Jewish people and he thought I can do that and make some money in the same time and he made some money but five minutes later the Gestapo came around our house and we were all arrested I'll never forget father he was so old, he was 84 years old, he did not quite understand uh, what happened. But when he was brought to the police station, when he passed the, the, the old clock in the corridor, he said, uh, <coughs> pull up the clock. <laughs> he, he meant he must be wind, wound the because clock. Because every day, every day he wound the clock. But, uh, he did not realize that he never should come back in that house. And then we came in the police station and uh, we, I remember that we asked when we were there, say, what have you in your shoe? And one said, I have Romans 8. And Peter van Woorden said, I have Second Corinthians 4. And Nolly, uh, my sister, said, I have a Ephesian 1. We had all taken one um, page of the Bible and put it in our shoe. But put a Gestapo took you away. Oh, yes, now, no, uh, for the others uh, could keep it, but they have taken it away from me, yes. So they took your father? Oh, my father and all his children, because my brother was uh, in our house to have a um, uh, Bible study group. And my, uh, all father's children, uh, my brother, two of my sisters, and me, and a grandson, and about 50 of my friends were arrested afterwards in the house. And you were taken? We were, I was taken in, uh, we were all brought into a prison. And there I was four months in solitary confinement. Solitary confinement? Yes, alone. Seven, five steps so, and two steps so, and always alone. But you know, it was not really alone. For Jesus was with me. Mm. And I will never forget when I said, Oh Lord, I cannot be alone anymore without any human beings. And suddenly I saw a little ant. And, and I saw him uh, go off the floor. And I said, Thank you, Lord. I have company. I have an aunt. <laughs> an aunt. And you say, eh? that little little uh, animals end. And, and uh, we had a good time together and we talked together. But when there was danger, that end always ran to a little hole in the wall. And then the Lord told me a little, uh, a, a little uh, a thing. He, he said, Corrie, that little ho uh, hole in the wall is the hiding place for that end. Don't forget that I am your hiding place. And so that little ant gave me a sermon. Your home had been a hiding place yes. for so many. They found refuge in your home. Yes, that is so. I, I praise the and Lord you for it. you found a hiding place Jesus. in Yes. He is our hiding place. Yes. Always. Did you get discouraged? Course. Yes. Yes. I often got discouraged. But then I just talked with the Lord. And it was as if progressively I got more acquainted with the Lord. Exactly in this very difficult time. And uh, when I told him and I asked forgiveness for my discouragement, for the Bible said we must be of good courage, then the Lord spoke to me, encouraged me. And uh, then I uh, just got um, uh, a, a change of look. Uh, look around and be distressed. Look within and be depressed. Look at Jesus and be at rest. And that is what I learned more and more. And you found his wonderful presence. Yes, he was there always. In prison. He was, he was there. 
but what uh, my friends prayed for me was that his presence should be very, uh, that it was very conscious to me. We, you know, we do not always realize that he's present, but the Holy Spirit makes us to realize that the Lord is with us. And then the worst can happen in your life. The best remains, and the be very best is yet to be, <laughs> for the suffering of this time is not worthy to be compared with the coming glory. But the only thing visibly that you could see, the only life, was just that one little ant. Yes, yes. Just the one? Yes, yes. It would come and go? Yes, it would come and go. First there were more, but they were not faithful. They ran away. But that one came every day as my little friend. <laughs> yes, it was a time that was very difficult. But, you know, one of the most difficult moments was when you awoke. When I awoke up, then, oh, it is so terrible to wake up in a prison. And then the first thing what I did was to sing, stand up, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. And after I had um, uh, finished it, I heard the song, some cells further, about four cells further. There was one who also knew that you, uh, the Lord Jesus. And then I heard the echo. Is that English? Echo, echo. And then uh, she sang, stand up, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. So we, we help the other prisoners around us, for that is so, we can stand up for Jesus because he is victor and he makes us more than victor, more than conquerors. You're in prison now, having been taken by the Gestapo. Tell about it. Yes, because we had uh, saved Jewish people, my family, my friends and I, and so I was in prison. We could have uh, known that that was a great possibility, for, but it was worthwhile. And, but when I was in prison it was almost worse than I thought. I'm so glad that you remember that little story of the end. <laughs> <laughs> but I also remember that once I was uh, called out and um, I was brought before my judge. The judge was what they called their Sachbearbeiter. <coughs> and uh, such a man had your life in his hands. When that man should say I had, should have been shot, I should have been shot. He asked me much. I was alone with him in a little room about my childhood, my certificates, my spare time, I told him all. <laughs> when he told, he asked me about my misdeeds, I did not tell him all. He has known of eight Jews that I have saved, and there were, <laughs> praise the Lord, far more. <clears throat> but uh, I had an opportunity to tell that man about the Lord Jesus. And Betsy, my sister, was questioned by him also again in alone with him in the little room and she told about the Lord Jesus and then she said uh, it is very important to speak about Jesus it is more important to speak to him do you allow me that I pray with you and he said yes and she prayed with him she the prisoner with her judge five times Betsy was questioned five times she prayed with him and later the judge I met in Germany, he said, I never in my life can forget your sister's prayers. But he became a friend instead of, of an enemy. But he had to do his, uh, his duty. I believe that the Lord has touched his heart, but yeah. he had to go on. And so I remember that he showed me papers found in my house. And he said, uh, these papers are found in your, your house. And I looked and I saw that these papers had names, addresses and particulars that could mean not only my death sentence, but the death sentence of my family and friends who were in prison. He said, can you explain these papers? I said, no, I can't. I have never felt so miserable. But he knew better than I how dangerous the papers were. And suddenly 
he turned, opened the door of the stove and threw all the papers into the flames. And I was so happy when I saw that in this stove all these papers were destroyed. I f felt really 100% happy. You sh I should never have believed that I could be 100% happy because to be. Because you knew that in that moment he could have sentenced you to death. Yes, and my family. But now the papers were destroyed. And do you know what I learned that moment? Better than I ever had understood that when we bring our sins to the Lord Jesus, the Bible says he cast him into the depths of the sea. <laughs> he blotted him out like a cloud. For at the cross Jesus has finished all what was necessary to take away our sins. And that great joy that our sins are blotted out. I understood when I saw these papers uh, destroyed by the flames. The finished work of Jesus at the cross, I understood when I saw this. Because the account was true. You couldn't deny a single no. thing. No. These were members of your family. Yes. These were Jews that you had been protecting. Yes. I believe that God touched his heart. I believe God touched his heart. Yes. Yes. I and he took it. them all and just threw them into the flames. Just as though it never existed. Yes, yes. They Jesus, were gone. Jesus does that. Yes. Jesus does that. Yes, that he does and without And he even blots it out of his memory. Yes. Our past is all he blotted out. He casts him over his shoulder. <laughs> the what happened said. then? Now, then um, I was brought, we were brought into concentration camps. First oh. in Holland and then la later in uh, Germany. But the good thing was that there I was together with Betsy, my sister. We had lived together 53 years, always in the same house. And then I had been away from her for a month, and now we were together again. And I will never forget that what I saw in Betsy. I remember that there was a man uh, who was beating her. And when she came to me, I saw that her face was really very red and swollen by the beatings. I said, Betsy, has that man beaten you? She said, yes, and I am so sorry for that man. You see, that was Betsy. She had a tremendous love. And that was what I, um, what I experienced. I learned so much from Betsy. I will never forget when we came into Ravensbrück. That was a camp that was far too full. We had to live with 700 in a room that was built for 200. And when I came there and I saw these this, this, uh, uh, rags on which we had to do a uh, kind of mattress, straw, I said, oh, Betsy, it is full of fleas and lies. And Betsy said, Cory, we must thank for God for everything. I said, I cannot thank God for fleas. And she said, we have to. But do you know what happened? Le uh, le we had a tremendous chance to give the Bible message to these people who were so packed together. Eh? Twice a day I gave a Bible message, uh, or Betsy. And uh, it was a forbidden book, the Bible. But never there came a God or an officer into our um, room because they were afraid to get lice or fleas <laughs> from us. So Betsy was quite right to thank for fleas, for if we had not had these fleas, we could not have brought the gospel to these many people. And the around. only reason that you were in prison and in the concentration camp was because you were protecting, because you were hiding the Jews. Yes, yes, yes. And <coughs> uh, Father always told us we must be we must be honored when we have even to die for mm -hmm. for God's old ancient people that will be an mm -hmm. honor. And Father died. Father died after ten days already in prison. And um, in uh, later Betsy died. 
and it was a miracle that I was set free. But I will tell you uh, what what happened with my Bible, for I told you that uh, I could bring twice a day a Bible message. I had a very little Bible. They, in the second uh, concentration camp, my family could send me a Bible. I had it under my, my uh, on my back, under my clothing. But when we entered in Ravensbrück, we all had to be searched. I will never forget it. We stood there on a line and I thought, oh, now they will find my Bible. I had also other things hidden under my clothing. And I said, Lord, Lord, help me. I said, Lord, send your angels and let your angels surround me. But then I thought, yes, angels, but angels are spirits. And you can look through a spirit, and these people may not see me. So I said, oh Lord, and make that my angels are not transparent today. You can pray very unorthodox when you are in great need, but God did it. <clears throat> you believe in miracles, I can tell you, I believe and I, exp I really uh, have experienced miracles. The woman who stood in front of me was searched. Then Betsy stood behind me and they did not see me. The angels surrounded me. Wasn't that a miracle? That happened twice. And an hour later, again we were searched. But now I was not afraid. I said, Lord, let your transparent angels still some moment surround me. Again, everyone was searched. They did not see me. Never touched you. No, but never touched me. They didn't see me. So I came in the barrack with my Bible. Can you imagine what that meant? And I gave every day twice a Bible message. Or Betsy did it. And it was a, a joy to um, to bring this, this uh, the, to tell these people around me, when you give uh, in your heart room for Jesus, he will give you a peace that passes all understanding. And sometimes they said, oh, how, how is that possible in this terrible prison? I said, just do it. And then the people asked Jesus to come in, into their hearts. And they got a peace, that peace that only Jesus can give. And uh, it, it was a, a joy to see how the people changed. There came really mm -hmm. a great joy that. in their hearts. And I have never talked so much about the, uh, the, 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 uh, the heaven. I heaven. Heaven, yes. I could in tell. concentration. Yes, I could tell about people. Peace and death. The, the, the best we have to be, <laughs> be people. When you die, and then uh, you will be with the Father. And Jesus has said, I go and I, in my Father's house mm -hmm. are many mansions. I, I go to prepare one for everyone who believes in me. And then I said, people, the suffering of this time is not worthy to be compared with the coming glory. The, the promises of the Bible became such a joyful reality. Now, and I told you about that miracle of the angels around me, but also in the little things of everyday life you can experience miracles. For not only the great things are the Lord, mm -hmm. but also every, uh, uh, everything, the trivial things of every day are in the hands of the Lord. And whatever happens, be sure that your everyday life is for the honor of the Lord. I remember that when I was uh, there only a few days that I had caught a cold. I said, Betsy, what must I do? I have no hanky. And I have caught a cold. She said, now pray. <laughs> I, I smiled. But she did it. She folded her hands and she said, the Lord, Corrie has caught a gold. And she needs a hanky. Will you give her one, Father, in the name of Jesus? Amen. I must confess you, I smiled. But do you know what happened? She had just said, Amen. I heard that they called out my name. I went to the window and stood a friend of mine, also a prisoner, who worked in the hospital. And I said, Do you come, are you free? Can you come to visit me? She said, no, no, I'm not free. I just give you a little present. I opened it and it was a hanky, a handkerchief. I said, why in the world do you bring me a handkerchief? 
Did you know that I have caught a cold? She said, no, but I was folding handkerchiefs in the um, hospital. I had found an old sheet and I was just making little handkerchiefs handkerchiefs of that old sheet and when I was doing that the Lord told me for there was a voice in my heart who said bring immediately a hanky to Cory ten Boom. We have a Heavenly Father. Yes, isn't it? Cory, we have a Heavenly Father. Yes. If he cares for the falling sparrow, the most insignificant thing in the world. If he cares of that little sparrow and sees the little sparrow when he falls, we're his children. Corey, he loves us. He's interested even in the language. Yes, and there's nothing too great for his power and nothing too small for his love. I believe that. That is, that's a joy. And I, I have never experienced so his love in that hell, for it was a hell. We were surrounded by people who had had the hell, training yeah. in cruelties, and they did our utmost to make our life as terrible as possible. And there I have understood what it means that God's love is available. When hatred came into uh -huh. my heart, the Holy Spirit brought uh -huh. into my heart the love of God. And I will never forget a roll call. We stood there. We had to stand three hours every morning on roll call. Three icy cold hours. Cold. It was cold. At 3.30 till 6.30. And what kind of clothing did you have? Oh, far too little. Very, very little bit. And But later in November we got a coat, but it was, it was not enough. And I could hardly bear that morning to see and to hear what there happened in front of me. A God was using that time to, ex to show his cruelties. But suddenly a skylark came and started to sing in the sky. And all the prisoners looked up and listened to the bird's song. And when I looked at the bird, I looked at the sky. And I thought at Psalm 103 where it's written, As high is heaven over the earth, so high is God's mercy and love over all that fear him. And it was as if I woke up to reality. Oh, love of God, how deep and great, far deeper than man's deepest state. And God sent that skylark three weeks daily, exactly during roll call time, to turn away our eyes from the cruelty of man unto the ocean of God's love. Yes, God's love still stands also when all else has fallen, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 in the translation of Philip's. I will never forget that 250 of the youngest uh, people were sent to an ammunition uh, uh, factory <coughs> and in the midnight at 12 o'clock they should leave the camp and uh, I said Lord will you give me something to do for these younger prisoners and I climbed out of my uh, window and there was always a searchlight going over this camp and so I waited till the third light was gone and I, I ran to the other side. And always when it was dark, I ran till I came near to the gate. And it was 12 o'clock, there they came, marching on, 250 uh, prisoners. And I did not know what should weigh them, perhaps the, the, that muni munitions um, factory could be bombed. And as soon as one passed me, I was just in a little corner, I said, Jesus is Victor. And she looked at me and said, Corrie, they can kill you for that. Go back to your... But then she was already gone. And I said, underneath us are the everlasting arms. And I said, Lord, give me for every one a text. And uh, then uh, the next I said, God's love still stands also when all else has fallen. And then again, Jesus is Victor. And uh, after they had passed all, then I 
came again back into my barrack and the Lord protected me. Later, um, a doctor's wife told me, who also was with this group, she said, Corey, we came in a munition f f uh, factory and there was a terrible bomb uh, uh, bombardment and we were not allowed to go to the shelter. And I was sitting there in a the corner and I just said, Lord, Corrie ten Boom has said it, Jesus is Victor. <coughs> and she said, I just repeated this, Jesus is Victor. All these people, no, 249 of these 250 people came out alive. From us, there were only 20% who came out alive. It was so that uh, I saw that Betsy got weaker and weaker. And once she awakened me in the midst of the night, and she said, Corrie, God has uh, told me something. When we are set free, we must do three things. First, we must open a house in Holland. I've seen it. It was so beautiful. Oh, there were such beautiful uh, windows and oh, beautiful colors and many, many flowers. We were hungry for colors in the camp. And there, in that house, we will help the people who will, uh, who have lost their life, uh, the, the, uh, lost uh, the way through life again. And they will find the way through life again in that uh, um, house. And Corrie, we can tell them from experience that Jesus' light is stronger than the deepest darkness. We must not stay there. This camp is now used to destroy lives after war. These concentration camps will not have any use. We must ask God to give us a concentration camp after war. And we will use it to build up lives instead of destroy lives. But we must not stay there. We must travel over the world. <laughs> we have a message from experience that a child of God cannot go so deep. Always deeper are the everlasting arms mm -hmm. of the Lord. During all that time in the concentration camps, all that you had was his word. While you were helping all those precious Jews, all that you had was the word of God. And you knew God's wonderful promise. And a way back there, what, the third generation, your father's father knew the same word. Yes. And what had he said way back there about the Jewish people? Uh, he prayed for the peace of Jerusalem and the salvation of the Jews in his house, my grandfather. It was back there in 18 what? 1844, 100 years before, in that same house of grandfather, we were all arrested, father's, uh, grandfather's son for his grandchildren and a great-grandson. And that was, uh, I see that always as such a uh, uh, wonderful, strange, divine, but not to understand, uh -huh. uh, w working together, uh, uh, guidance of the Lord. Oh. It was really... We've got a glorious heavenly yes. Father. Yes, but <coughs> they, uh, four of us had to give our lives in prison. But it was That for is true, Corey. Sure. There was your father. My brother. Your brother. His son. His son. And my sister. And your younger sister. Yeah. Well, we were talking about um, your prison life. Continue. What happened to your sister? It was there in Ravensbrück that my sister died. She was not aware of it. And this concentration camp was where? It was uh, north of Berlin in, uh, uh, in Germany and uh, was far, far away from Holland. And, uh, How were you taken there? Uh, we were first in prison in Holland because we had saved Jewish people and then uh, they brought us from Holland to uh, that uh, camp what was for women, a women's camp in uh, north of Berlin. 
and uh, that was there, that was a terrible camp. Ninety five thousand women were killed or died in that camp. Ninety five thousand. Yes. Yes. Also, my sister died there in that camp. Yes. That one camp alone. Yes. And uh, <coughs> I was so sad when I I saw that that she had died. But suddenly, I saw her face, and on that, that face was so beautiful. It was as if there was, if it was a young Betsy, my, uh, she looked so, uh, so heavenly happy when she, uh, her, that, that dead body. And I understood, I, m I must just be, be grateful that she is in heaven. And a week later, I was set free by a diff uh, by a blunder of men uh, and a miracle of God for another week later they killed all the women of my age only 20% of us have come out alive and when I was free uh, I, mm -hmm. I knew there is work to do Betsy had said it to me Betsy had said we must go over the world because we have a message from experience that the light of Jesus Christ is stronger than the deepest darkness and only those who have been in a concentration camp know what darkness that was and I could tell what Jesus had been for me and that you cannot have a compromise with Jesus you have ah. to surrender all ah. uh -huh. and she had told me we must open a house in Holland and we must uh, rent a concentration camp in Germany because there will be so many people who have no homes and then we must travel over the world. And I did it. <coughs> I worked in 62 countries in these last 26 years. And I'm uh, very happy that uh, I, can, uh, I can reach so many people. But uh, one of the great lessons, again, I learned when I was in Munich and there I met the man who had been so very cruel to my sister. And that man came to me and said, I have found the Lord Jesus as my Savior. And I have a Bible and I know when I uh, ask forgiveness for my sins that the Lord will forgive me. I know that I had needed forgiveness for terrible cruelties. But then I have prayed, give me the grace that I ask one of my very victims forgiveness. And that's why I come to you, Fräulein Ten Boom, will you forgive me? And I must confess you, Catherine, confess you, I, I felt a bitterness in my heart, mm -hmm. almost a hatred when I th remembered how my dying sister had, had suffered through him. But then I knew, when we do not forgive, the Heavenly Father will not forgive us. That's what Jesus has said. it wasn't always easy. No, this was not easy at all. But then I said, Lord, I claim your promise of Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God is shed abroad into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to me, to us. <coughs> and Lord, that love must overcome now this bitterness. You know, I like so very much to pray with an open Bible and say, Father, you have said yeah. it, now you must do it. And God yeah. likes it, for he has yeah. meant all the promises. Yeah, God <laughs> likes it. Oh, he, he, he likes when we really claim his, his riches. And, and there you stood face to face with the man yes. who had been so cruel to your sister. Yes. And I could only hate him, but that love of God changed my heart at the same moment I could say brother give me a hand and I shook hands with him and it was as if I felt the love of God stream through my arm you never touch so the ocean of God's love as mm -hmm. that you love your enemies you can't I cannot but Jesus in us mm -hmm. can for he fills us with the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and the fruit of the Spirit is love even for enemies it was one of the greatest miracles that I experienced for a moment, you hesitated. But yes, only a moment. Yeah. 
it because it is a fight. It is a uh, it is a we are have still to fight not with flesh and blood mm -hmm. but with the very representatives of headquarters of evil, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, but we stand on victory ground because Jesus is victor. Is, uh, I did not know before that one week before they killed all the women of my age in the gas chamber, I should be set free. So when I saw the smoke go up in the crematorium in Ravensbrück, I often asked myself, when will be my time to be killed? So I stood, as it were, before eternity. Before and when you stand before eternity you see things so simple because life and death and eternity is very simple you see I saw there the devil he was stronger much stronger than I but there was Jesus and Jesus is stronger much stronger than the devil and together with Jesus I am stronger much much stronger than the devil that is so, so, so simple, but it is an, a value that I have learned, learned there and what I can tell other people. Were you afraid? Sometimes I was, but then I brought that fear to the Lord and the, uh, asked him forgiveness and God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love and a sound mind. And that uh, the Holy Spirit in me took away all the fear and gave me power and love and sound mind. That uh, you can always depend on Him. That's a joy. I cannot depend on myself, but oh, what a joy to uh, to bring this message over the whole world. And I like to work in prisons because I understand prisoners. I know how it feels to be behind a door that you can only open from outside. And I stand beside them. I do not, do not say when I am in prison, you are criminals and you have been wet boys that you came here. I was a good woman that I came in prison because I had done something good. Oh no, mm -hmm. for I know that in the eyes of God, I am a criminal without him. I could hate and hatred is a uh, murder in God's eyes and it is by the grace of God that I can love my enemies. So I stand beside these men and these women in prisons and oh it is a joy to tell them uh, about what I have experienced because uh, they understand oh uh, Corrie ten Boom does not tell something of theory or theology it is a reality it is it is a uh, uh, but experience. I'll never forget I was in Bermuda in a uh, prison and I visited a man who was be behind the bars and um, he was a murderer and he had had a weapon and he had tried to turn to run away and he had on the back of his uh, uniform a red rag. I asked the guard that man tried to run away. He said, yes, how do we know that? I said, I have been a prisoner. And when we run, uh, tried to run away, we got also a red rag uh, um, sewn on the back of our uh, uniform. He said, that man is sentenced to whippings and he was so afraid that he has tried to run away. Poor fellow, he has had a double portion. But uh, when I looked at that man, I said, oh Lord, give me a message for this man. And I said to him, listen, have you had a weapon? Yes. It was bad? Yes. Did it bring you to a hospital afterwards? No, it wasn't as bad. Then he stood up and came to the bar. He thought, what's that for a lady who asks such a question? I said, did they treat your wounds? Yes, they rubbed them. Then I asked, is there hatred in your heart? He said, hatred? My whole heart is full of hatred. I said, that I can understand. Ha, you. I said, yes, I. And then I told what was in my heart when the people were cruel to me and what I felt when they whipped my sister because she was too weak to shovel sands.
how the hatred came into my heart. And I said, Jesus did a miracle in my heart. He gave to his Holy Spirit so much of his love in my heart that I could forgive. And I said, when you receive Jesus as your Savior and bring him your sins, then the Lord will fill you with that love and with a peace uh, uh, that you a love and a joy that is passes understanding. And I said, in the Bible is written that those who come to Jesus, he will in no wise cast out. And Jesus has said, come unto me all. Mm -hmm. And that's also you. And that's, I said to that man, and that man accepted the Lord Jesus. I will never forget I put my hands through the bar doors and I said, let us pray together. And I prayed and then he prayed. I have never heard such an impossible prayer. <laughs> that man had never prayed before or heard a prayer. But do you know, he thanked God that Jesus had died at the cross for his mm -hmm. sins. And I know the angels rejoiced. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you ever thank God? for Jesus' cross, that he died for you at the cross. The angels rejoice, and it did not matter at all that it was such, right. an, uh, such an odd language. Eh? And that man said, have you another five minutes? I said, sure, why? He said, in the third cell at the other side of the corridor is a man in great darkness. Please tell him also about Jesus. And I went to the man in the third cell. And I told him of Jesus, and that man also made his decision for, the, for Jesus. He said yes to Jesus. He said, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior mm -hmm. and Lord. And I know that the angels rejoiced. And I, when before I left the prison, I said, say, fellow, that was good <laughs> that you sent me to him. He also has accepted the Lord Jesus as his Savior. And then he looked. Oh, around me and he shouted over the corridor hi brother <laughs> <laughs> I often think yes. when we enter the beautiful city and the saved all around us appear that many of them will tell us hi brother hi sister For and sure. the fight that you is here relationship and there is it makes us brothers and yes. sisters in the Lord yes that's true. Yes. Oh, that's true. Yes. And we had a glorious experience. Yes. You're left now. Your father yes. has gone home to glory. Betsy is gone. And you're still here to tell the story. Yes. Do you <coughs> know, Catherine, I believe in the blessing of Abram. So do I. Yes. God has said those who bless Abram will be blessed. And I think I am the happiest uh, woman of 80 years old of all that I know. Because I believe I, that. That is the blessing of Abram because my family have given their lives for the God. The Holy Spirit revealed that to me years ago. That's yes. one of the greatest, my first great revelation was regarding the Holy Spirit the wonderful third person of Trinity. And then the Holy Spirit has revealed that wonderful blessing yes. that is upon Abraham and the seed of Abraham, those that bless them yes. will be blessed of God. I believe that. Yes. You followed that? Yes. Yes, I, I believe that's why I am such a happy old woman. I <laughs> just don't look the world as I call myself a tramp for the Lord. And I can tell the people so often about uh, what I have experienced. And then uh, in telling my stories, I, the Lord shows his reality. Mm -hmm. And um, I often tell them about that experience that I had, one of the most terrible experiences that I have had in the concentration camp, when they stripped us of all our clothing, we had to stand naked. And I felt so miserable and so ashamed and so cold. I said, Betsy, I cannot bear this. 
This is worse than all the other cruelties that we have experienced. And suddenly it was as if I saw Jesus at the cross. And the Bible tells they took his garments. He, he hung there naked. And he hung there for me. And by my suffering, I understood a fraction of the suffering of Jesus. And it made me so thankful that I could bear my suffering. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. He did it through me. That's right, that is such a joy. He makes us channels of streams of living water. Everyone who follows him. I will never forget, even children he can use. I had once spoken about the, that beautiful text in Revelation 3.20, where Jesus knocks at the door of our hearts. And when you hear his voice and open the door, he comes in. And I said to the people, uh, if you have never done it before, do it. Ask Jesus to come into your heart, and if you have done it, just come forward and go to that room that's behind the altar. There's a huge church full of people. And there you will find people who can pray with you and help you. The first who came were two very tiny girls, so small, they had nothing understood of that room. So they remained staying in front of me. And one said, am I too small to ask Jesus to come into my heart? I said, no, Jesus is interested even in sparrows, and you are far bigger than a sparrow. <laughs> she said, then I can ask him. I said, yes, and she said, Jesus, I have been very naughty. Will you come into my heart and make it clean with your blood? Mm -hmm. And Jesus came. Everyone who says that, then Jesus comes. He didn't say, you are too small. Then I said to that other little girl, will you do the same? Now listen what she said. She said, I did it three weeks ago. And after that, I prayed every day for Betty. And now Betty has done it. I said, then you together must pray for a third little girl. They looked at each other the same moment they said, Anna. I said, that must be Anna. And they promised to pray for Anna. And when Anna should ask Jesus to come in her heart, they would pray for Anna for a fourth girl. And then, with four girls for the fifth, the chain reaction of the intercession mm -hmm. in, uh, in the hearts of two little uh, girls. And that, even uh, every grown-up can start such a chain reaction. That is the great joy that the, 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 we, we may pray for each other. And that is very important. 